Good morning, everybody. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. We have a rather lengthy uh, passage of Scripture to cover today, yet it contains only two advances in the life of Jesus that Luke wishes to put on display. The first is a, a brief reference to a preaching tour the Lord embarked upon. And the other is the more detailed account of the Lord's uh, experience ministering in Nazareth, his hometown. The 14th verse of Luke chapter 4 marks not just a chronological advance in Luke's history, but also an advance in what we might call our Lord's occupation. Uh, all that has come before has been preparatory the birth narratives and Jesus' early visit to Jerusalem, his baptism and the genealogy Luke uh, provides in order to link the Son of God to the humanity he had come to save, and, and finally his successful defeat of the temptations the devil brought before him. Now Jesus returns from uh, Judea and embarks upon an extended ministry in Galilee. Uh, the next major break in our study uh, will come in chapter 9 and verse 51 with a somewhat haunting report that when the days were approaching for his ascension, Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. Uh, to Jerusalem and all that awaited him there. Well, you know, of course, that the Lord has given us four separate Gospels each unique in their own way, but you also know that the Gospel of John is different uh, than the other three. And those other three, that what we call the synoptic Gospels, contain more common material uh, between them. And this incident in Nazareth, which Luke records and which we're about to read, comes much later in Matthew and Mark raising the question of why Luke uh, deliberately uh, brought it before us this early. He, he doesn't try to orient the episode to any specific time frame, uh, so it's legitimate for him to have done this. Uh, yet there had to have been a reason. That reason, I think, was to illustrate at the beginning the type of response Jesus met with as he undertook his mission. There was first a gleeful ex acceptance of his message and enthusiastic belief in him. But that was frequently followed by angry rejection. The Apostle Paul would later capture in colorful terms the effect Christ's person and message would have on those who met up with him and his followers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he described those encounters by the different aromas they triggered. He said, we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death, and to the other, an aroma from life to to life. And that captures uh, the different responses to the person of Christ. One may be a fresh fragrance of life and acceptance and worship of him, but he also has the opposite effect on others, an odor unlikable and offensive and from which one turns away in hatred and resentment. We see it in the Gospels. In our passage this morning, uh, Luke provides from the start, we see it in our passage this morning, we see it in our lives, in our life's experience, in our interactions uh, with community, in, in business, and wherever we, in family, wherever we are. Well, in our passage this morning, Luke provides from the start the generous and welcome reaction of some but also a snapshot of rejection from those we might have anticipated the warmest acceptance. And so we begin with verse 14, and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district, and he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. <clears throat> 
And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. So we're in the synagogue. Jesus stands up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book, or the scroll, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, and here I just want to interject, uh, according to the pattern of uh, synagogue worship, this is probably a, just a one-line synopsis of the sermon that followed. He began to say to them, verse 21, today... This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, he puts words in their mouth. He said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, Heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Do it here uh, so that we can see these things. And he said, verse 24, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth that there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. After his anointing by the Spirit at his baptism and then his withstanding the devil's temptations, Jesus, it appears, launched his official ministry by first returning to the region where he grew up. North to Galilee and the cities that we are so familiar with from our reading of the New Testament, he had wind in his sails we might say, empowered by the Spirit as he made his way from synagogue to synagogue. He had come to the Jew first, as we learn, and so it was only reasonable to find him meeting with them in their accustomed place of congregation and, and utilizing the religious services to make himself known to them and to begin his saving ministry among them. News spread, Luke reports. We know how that works. Uh, this was something novel taking place, a, a presence people were unaccustomed to, and a message that transfixed those who heard, and their initial reaction was popular acceptance. He was praised by all. Here was the first waft of something new of a personality and both a, a style of teaching and its substance, unique and different. Jesus was making a splash wherever he went. Uh, Luke would have us understand he was becoming famous. And then he came to Nazareth. We're also familiar uh, with the town 
of Nazareth. It's easy to lose the sense of spareness. It's mentioned, elicited. It was the town Nathaniel had sneeringly dismissed with his derisive retort, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Luke says this is where Jesus had been brought up. According to Matthew 2.23, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Uh, Nazareth was his hometown, the place where he was best known, where he had family, and the people most acquainted with him lived there. So when we read in verse 16 that he entered uh, the synagogue there on the Sabbath day, we must understand that he was entering an assembly in the same way as we might say a person entered into his home church, went home to his home church, church. They knew him. Uh, Many had grown up with him, perhaps played with him as children, and observed him grow into the man he now was in a manner unlike others, but still as one of them, as a a Nazarene. And they would not have been surprised to see him there. It, It was his custom to be there on the Sabbath. Luke makes mention of that. Of course he was there. Uh, It was where the Jews came together as the people of God to learn about him, to hear the scriptures read and taught, to sing songs of praises to him. It was a mark of Jesus' faithfulness to God that he was there. And one can't help but be reminded of the author of Hebrews' admonition in chapter 10, verse 25 of Hebrews, that following in his footsteps, uh, his church, Uh, not forsake their own assembling together, but come and find encouragement and give encouragement. All the more, the author says, as we see the day uh, drawing near. That's what you're doing. Uh, That's what we're doing. We've come. We've not forsaken the assembling together. And that was Jesus' habit. Well, you may well know that the typical synagogue meeting followed a somewhat regular pattern. Luke's account reflects that, though he opts not to give every detail, but we find in the Mishnah uh, some details of the typical service. First, there was private prayer, followed by some sort of liturgical pronouncement of the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6, which begins, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. So there was a liturgical expression of that. And then came the central expression of the public reading of the scriptures. Uh, First, uh, from the Pentateuch, uh, out of the Torah scroll, Uh, Then, after the scroll was returned to its place, there would be a reading from the prophets, and that was followed by a sermon or a a word of exhortation from what had just been read. And at the end, either a closing prayer or a type of Aaronic uh, benediction that we're familiar with, the Lord bless you and keep you, etc. Well, Luke picks up in the passage Uh, the synagogue worship with the reading from the prophets. He kind of cuts right to the reading uh, from the prophets, and he states that Jesus uh, stood up to read, standing a a mark of respect for the word of God. The custom was to stand to read and then to sit down to deliver uh, the sermon. But it was Jesus who stood on this day. No doubt it had been arranged beforehand for him to give the reading. It was not uncommon for a distinguished member uh, or a visitor uh, to be selected for such an important role. Perhaps he had uh, requested uh, to read the passage that was chosen. We're not told, but uh, Luke describes how the book of the scroll, I like to think of it as a scroll because it was a scroll, how the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and he opened the scroll and he found the place that he was to read from. The reading was from a combination of 
this is somewhat important, a combination of Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2, and likely a snippet from Isaiah 58 verse 6, the part about the setting free those who are oppressed. Notably, he omitted one clause out of Isaiah 61 referring to the day of the vengeance of our Lord because that final act of God would be reserved to a later day, to his second coming. So he stopped at that point before reading that portion. But the passage, and we read it a moment ago, uh, prophesies of how a spirit-filled Messiah would minister to people in distress. We are people in distress perhaps not at the moment, and things might be going great for us uh, right now, but we have been in distress, and perhaps you're you're now in distress. You will be in distress. We don't look forward to those days, but uh, that's what the prophecy is, how a spirit-filled Messiah would minister to people in distress, to the poor and to the enslaved and to the blind, and oppressed. His coming would be the signal beginning of the favorable year of the Lord. This was the purpose for which Jesus had come. At his baptism, the Spirit had descended upon him, filling him and empowering him to go and pronounce the good news for the troubled people of the world. His gospel would first be for the poor. Uh, These are the truly needy who understand their need. They know they're needy. It's the same word that we uh, saw in the Sermon on the Mount, patoikos. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' ministry was to be reserved for those who would forsake pride and arrogance and admit to their need of mercy and grace. Isaiah 66, verse 2, describes such a person. But to this one I look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. And that would characterize the Lord's uh, ministry, seeking and confronting those who felt this deficit of worthiness. In the same way, this uh, spirit-imbued prophet was sent to set free those who are captives, like prisoners of war who, who cannot escape but are doomed to their captivity. These are the objects of his releasing power. The scriptures describe uh, fallen mankind as slaves to sin, un- unable to flee their captivity, but chained to their inability and their misery. But according to the scripture, uh, Messiah Messiah breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. Next, the passage promised their Savior would bring recovery of sight to the blind. Uh, Jesus would do that literally, we know, but the meaning here likely extended to spiritual uh, blindness. The Jews' leaders, Jesus would come to say, were like the blind leading uh, the blind. But he also promised in John chapter 9, verse 39, that he had come into the world to, so that those who do not see may see. The next to last clause of his quotation may have come from Isaiah 58, or it may have been something of a general commentary on the proceeding, but its meaning would become real in the lives of generations to come. He would free his followers from the painful oppression of this sinful world. And finally, he had come to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This was an allusion to the year of Jubilee uh, out of the Mosaic Law, when on every 50th year the slaves were uh, set free, Uh, Debts forgiven, fields left bare, and a general amnesty was observed at Jubilee, the favorable year of the Lord. It encapsulated the messianic reign and summarized the purpose uh, 
for his coming. God had sent Jesus, God had sent his son to spread his favor upon these he has so described. And at that, Jesus closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. What would he say now that he had finished this very pointed reading? He held their attention like none who had ever been there before. Every person in attendance was now looking only to him. There was an atmosphere of tense expectancy. And Luke seems to be describing with his summation in verse 21, the ensuing content of his sermon. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, he said today, uh, that's important. Today, his audience was accustomed to scriptures being read and sermons delivered, urging a hope for a future deliverance and the coming of a deliverer. Uh, one day, some day, but never today, uh, Jesus' message was that not in a future age, but now would the captive power of sin be broken. Uh, communion with God established and the will of God finally done today. That today uh, still rings true whenever the gospel is proclaimed. For every sinner, uh, poor in spirit, burdened by their sin and oppressed by the misery that it brings, today is the moment when liberation from guilt and the sense of com condemnation is freely available. Jesus' promise is true still and waiting to be apprehended freely by faith in him alone. Today, for whoever doesn't have it, today is the day. But here uh, now in the synagogue, you note this, you read carefully, there seemed to arise more of a kind of confusion uh, Luke tells us all were speaking well of him. Literally, they were testifying of him. So perhaps they were whispering to one another. Perhaps there was a time for them to communicate with each other. Uh, the New English Bible reading is there was a general stir of admiration, that kind of positive disposition towards someone who has spoken impressively. We know that feeling. Later, we don't think as highly of it upon reflection. And they were wondering, Luke adds, at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. So uh, first, a modicum of admiration, perhaps of grudging admittance, as many would later say, never have we heard a man speak such as this man has, has spoken. But... Well, they had known him. They'd known him since he was a, a boy, a little child. And so there was also some murmuring. Well, this is Joseph's son. Mark's gospel uh, amplifies, his account of this amplifies uh, their negative a spin. They said, where did this man get these things? And, and what is this wisdom given to him? And is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon are not his sisters here? We know this family. Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. What little wonder or admiration, admiration they felt at his words, in other words, quickly melted into resentful skepticism. Jesus knew what they were thinking. Uh, words and self-adulation were well and good, but what did he have to back it up? So he put a well-known proverb into their mouths. Physician, heal yourself. Uh, 
That is, you say your one thing, uh, put it into practice so we can witness it and verify it. We've heard the, you know, tales from Canterbury, tales from Capernaum. We've heard those and those other cities of the impressive signs that you've performed. That's all well and good. Here we are. You're right in front of us. We've known you your whole life. Bring it on. <laughs> We're waiting. We're sitting in judgment upon you right now. Jesus had come into his hometown, into his home church. I'm paraphrasing. He, he had come into his hometown and hit a brick wall. His hometown didn't believe him. They did not believe him. Their perspective was that if Jesus wanted to put his money where his mouth was, he should perform some kind of magic trick uh, to prove it. But the Lord was not into dog and pony shows meant to attract shallow followers. And so with sadness, he, he saw through their cynicism. For him, it was merely another proverb known to them in verse 24, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Now it was, and it is, uh, proverbial that familiarity breeds contempt that great men are all, and women are often doubted and their achievements diminished among the people who know them best. And they simply will not accord them the acceptance and the recognition they merit. Uh, people are always more eager to find greatness in strangers than in their own kind. So as I said, they simply did not uh, believe him. In Mark's gospel. He says it a little more plainly in verse 5 of Mark chapter 6. He could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them and he wondered at their unbelief. He wondered. He marveled. He was astonished at their unbelief. According to Luke, uh, now in verse 25, he also went on the offensive using two Old Testament examples. The first from the life of Elijah the prophet, verse 25. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. When there's unbelief, as there was in Nazareth, and as there was in Israel when Isaiah, uh, when Elijah prophesied, God's grace will reveal itself in ways often considered outside the normal. And you remember this story, the people of Israel were in, in dire straits because of their idolatry, because of their rebellion against God. Uh, they were under his discipline and God withheld his mercy while they remained in that posture. And so in the midst of this famine on the land, Elijah met up with a widow from Sidon, a Gentile. Uh, who was gathering up sticks to make a fire, to make a final meal for her and her son to eat, and then they could die. She was one of many uh, starving in the land. She wasn't the only one. There were, there were many starving in the land, including many proud Israelites who were presuming on God's grace. But it was only to her that God sent Elijah with the promise that the jar of flour and the jug of oil would not go empty until the Lord sent rain upon the land. And the point of Jesus' comparison was that he would do the same with regard to Nazareth and the other pockets of Jewish unbelief when he brought the gospel to the Gentile world. As John 
uh, wrote, he came to his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believed in his name. God's grace invariably came to those who understood their great need and were willing to cast themselves on the mercies of God. There's a wideness in God's mercy that is blind to privilege and self-regard, and that was the Lord's point in reminding the Nazarenes of that episode in Israel's past. The second illustration reinforces the point in verse 27. You know that story as well out of 2 Kings chapter 5 when Elisha, this time Elisha, uh, instructed the great Syrian commander Naaman to simply wash himself in the Jordan River in order to rid himself of his leprosy. He was initially too proud to condescend to that and stormed out in rage. What turned him, remember, uh, was the realization that his thinking was faulty. Uh, his, uh, he had been willing to go to the greatest lengths and do whatever was necessary to find a cure for his leprosy, but those who loved him uh, convinced him that if he would only humiliate himself before the true God, there would be healing. If he would only humble himself before Almighty God, there'd be healing. So he obeyed and the scripture says that his, his skin became like the flesh of a little child. There were many lepers in the land of Israel, but only the non-Israelite received God's mercy. Well, Jesus, he made his point, and the people responded in, in rage, Luke says, uh, grace is always the enemy of the self-righteous. And now that they understood the intent of this humble carpenter's penetrating words, they felt the condemnation. They understood. Uh, he was saying they were poor and enslaved and blind and unwittingly oppressed and that he was the one who would deliver them. Worse, he had defined them as of a lower caliber of worth than the hated Gentiles. And they would not stand for it. Hometown, hometown son or not, when he shined the light of their inadequacy and hypo hypocrisy, they stormed forward to lynch him. However, against all odds. They were unsuccessful. Luke concludes the account in verse 30, but passing through their midst, he went his way. I want to say he escaped unscathed, but that really doesn't reflect Luke's language. There, there's something regal about his response to their attack. No one that day had the ability or the authority to harm the Lord. He was untouchable. And he went his way, passing through their midst. Well, we're not told what the future held for the people of Nazareth. For the place that had seen Jesus reared as far as the scriptures testify, Jesus never passed that way again. Rejection can be final. If this was his last visit, he had brought with him a, a final fragrance of sorts, an aroma that for the people of Nazareth was from death to death. Jesus had pointed them to grace with his allusion to the widow of Zarephath and to Naaman the Syrian, he appealed to them 
uh, not to think their position before God was based on their supposed privileges. Their approach to God would necessarily require them to relinquish privilege and come to him only as penitent beggars. That's always the mark of a true child of God. And for such as those, Jesus is a fragrance from life to life. The Lord had encouraged that upon the citizenry of his hometown, but they had rejected him. They refused the path of blessing he held out. The sixth chapter of John, that, that chapter might be a theme chapter of our church, but you know that sixth chapter of John is a very long chapter. I, that's the point I'm making here. It's a very long chapter, 71 verses. And when you begin reading that, that chapter, John chapter 6, there are great crowds following the Lord. Uh, they're, they're, he, he is famous. Uh, there are these great crowds following him. He had performed all these miraculous signs of healing and mercy, and they sought after him to be a part of the sensation. That's what was going on. Uh, you know, we see, we see it today. Whatever is hot at the moment, people rush into it. Uh, and that's what people were doing at the beginning of John chapter 6. But by the time you reach the final verses of the chapter, you, you encounter grumbling and disappointment. Uh, Jesus had said some very difficult things in, in that chapter. And so he addresses the few remaining followers, saying, there are some of you who do not believe. There are some of you who do not believe. And Many of those people who were, had been disciples in name only withdrew from him that day. It was over for them. The, they were no longer enamored uh, with this famous man. But Jesus explained it this way. He said, no one can come to me except the Father in heaven grants it to him, gives it to him as a free gift. No one can. No one has the ability to come to me unless it's been granted him from the Father. No one can know Jesus Christ and receive his forgiveness and salvation apart from the grace of God. Here we are. Uh, the, we are the church of Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is filled with lepers. We are uh, filled with hungry, helpless vagabonds who have been drawn into God's family by his grace alone. Christ found us in our distress, and he brought consolation to us. We're like the widow of Nain, of whom Dan spoke yesterday in, in the memorial service for Inska. Uh, we are the ones of whom our gospel writer Luke wrote, that he saw us and he felt compassion for us. And then he brought healing into our lives, just like he's brought healing to Inska, just like he's brought uh, spiritual healing to us. And one day all of us will be fully healed. He saw us. He felt compassion for us. We're the objects of his grace. We don't know why except that he tells us he loves us. That's the only reason. So all glory to God. All glory to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Savior of sinners. Amen. Father, thank you uh, for loving us that way. Thank you for uh, being compassionate. Uh, thank you for not seeking those who deserve your favor somehow, for none of us deserve uh, your favor. Uh, thank you for the miracle of grace that uh, you have been an aroma of life to us. Uh, and it is a, a lovely fragrance. Uh, thank you for 
uh, knocking down, barging through our unbelief, our skepticism, our pride, uh, our desire for our own glory, and giving us just a little bit uh, and hopefully more and more of a desire in our hearts that you be put on the throne, that you be adulated and adored and worshiped and glorified and honored and not ourselves. We pray, Lord, that that would be the case in our lives and that we might be your instruments uh, to spread this gospel of grace uh, wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen.